ready to get started. Hope, uh, how's everything going at the conference so far? Good, good, good. Um, my name is Tom Wilson. I'm a lead instructor at the uh, Jack Russell Coding School and JRS Innovation Center. Um, also Chief Technology Innovation Officer at Tableau Rasa Healthcare. Um, and what I reached out to Carl this morning uh, because we had a couple of speakers cancel and said, I, I can talk about Couch TV. So this is just a, a very, uh, more of a, a story discussion about Couch TV and no fancy slides, no fancy animation, but hopefully uh, I think everyone will learn something about it and, um, and we'll see how it goes. So feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. Um, what we're gonna try to do is really get into why we want to, why CouchDB? Why am I standing up here saying that CouchDB is awesome? And then maybe just touch a little bit of the basics. Um, and then I want to show you uh, a, a couple of tricks that I think uh, regardless of whether you use CouchDB or not, um, you may find useful. And then finally, um, the ability to find. So CouchDB2 gives you the ability to um, use a MongoDB-like where syntax. So you can uh, use this uh, where syntax to find things dynamically, which is kind of cool. So one of the quotes from uh, a long time uh, CouchDB contributor is, CouchDB is bad at everything except replication. <laughs> so you're like, why should I learn CouchDB if it's really bad at everything? Um, but actually, replication is uh, something that is really hard to do. And uh, CouchDB really uh, put that up front so that um, it can be OK at everything else, and it's not horrible, but it could be okay, but replication is like the first thing. And when you start to grow and scale and you want to move databases around, um, want to move data around, it turns out that replication is something that, that turns into something being very valuable very quickly. Um, so CouchDB uh, is basically built, and if you saw Tripp's talk uh, about the offline first, it's built to basically be bolt on for offline first applications. And I'm a big proponent of the direction that we should go as developers and really start to think in the concepts of building applications that are offline capable and uh, that users can use anywhere because our um, demands of the users, right? Um, saw a tweet a few months ago where a user was complaining about the latency of the internet 44,000 feet in the sky um, streaming her Netflix movie, right? <laughs> so um, if we want to have any kind of efficiency when we email folks to Mars and they email back, then we really need to be able to replicate data pretty quickly. And, uh, and according to Elon Musk, we're gonna be on Mars in what, 2085, was that? <laughs> Is that the date? I don't know. Um, but, but anyway, our, um, our ability and need to access technology is rapidly changing to be everywhere. And uh, in order to do that, uh, replication plays a huge part. Um, the, the other side of, of Couch TV is resiliency, right? Um, since it is really a append-only database, so everything that goes into it is immutable, um, it is very hard to crash. Literally, the only thing that I've seen bad over the last um, six years with CouchDB, and it's not really bad because you never lost data, but the hard disk gets full, right? So that's, the hard disk gets full, and it just says, okay, I just can't do anything right now. Um, but everything else, it's really, really hard to crash a CouchDB um, because of the architecture. So in healthcare, when you can't really afford to lose data, um, that's a good thing, right? And with replication, um, if you're familiar, how many of you guys use Git and GitHub, right? How many of you really enjoy the distributed database feature? The fact that <laughs> you know, 
if it's on this laptop and my laptop somehow gets into the ocean, I know that I can go and get a new laptop and get my data back. Um, that's what CouchDB provides, right? So you can replicate, um, so you get resiliency across data centers. And then the idea of a document database. And you know, you always want to make sure that you validate your data coming in. But um, when you're first getting started with a proof of concept or you're you know, really trying to validate the application, um, you want to have that flexibility and that ability to change your model because oftentimes when you're doing your architecture um, oversight before your product is launched is not the same model that you're going to end up uh, six months into your product's release, a year into your product's release. So having that flexibility um, to be able to modify that, uh, again, with uh, the ability to apply schema validation on um, JSON documents is huge, um, and that ability to change. Um, Couch only speaks HTTP, and uh, back when it first started with HTTP, uh, a lot of people were like, that's a bad idea, but now Postgres speaks HTTP, and other databases speak HTTP. It, it is turning out that um, that's a really good way to uh, exchange information. Um, but the really benefit I see with, with HTTP is the fact that pretty much every programming language on the planet speaks HTTP. So if you really want to write you know, a web application in R and it speaks HTTP, you can do that, right? Um, or if you uh, want to transpile your Go into JavaScript, which you can do that now, um, and run JavaScript in the browser, it will talk HTTP. Um, you know, and uh, I don't know if any of you guys ever had um, pain points, but when I was working with like Microsoft SQL Server back in the day and I wanted to run it on a Unix box, um, it was actually a huge pain point to find quality drivers that would connect and talk to that protocol. Um, and the vice versa, not so much, but, but MySQL on the other side. Um, does anyone remember access databases, how horrible <laughs> that was, right? Um, with Couch speaking HTTP, really any computing platform that can talk HTTP, you can connect to and interchange data with. And I think that's very, very viable. Um, the other side is, um, you know, and, and I think they may have changed now, but um, the relational databases would basically never talk back to you, right? You would always have to pull information from those databases. Couch has a change of speed, so it can talk back to you. It can actually push information back to your apps, and this it gives you the ability to architect in a more loosely coupled way, right? So you could have a microservice that its only job is to send um, announcement emails to people that register, and that doesn't have to be coupled into your main app. It can be sitting as a separate service, consuming a changes feed, and say, hey, when I get a new um, account, let me send this email. And the nice thing about that is if your app changes, that service doesn't have to change, or if that service changes, your app doesn't have to change. So you get that distributed nature by uh, leveraging the ability of Couch to speak to you. And then my favorite, absolutely favorite part about Couch is uh, it's open source, but it's run by the Apache Foundation, which means that it is um, all the features, all the pieces that go to it is completely um, done via governance. And there's no one person or one company uh, driving all the changes. Um, and the, the reason that's uh, valuable, and, and there was a, a blog post a couple of days ago on Firebase, uh, and uh, you know, uh, again, um, Firebase is an awesome tool, and I think uh, Google does an excellent job at managing that, but if they decide to change the pricing model, you know, you're, you're stuck with that, right? With uh, the open source, if you leverage you know, Google's data structure, you can um, continue to use CouchDB um, 
if they want to change the pricing structure and you're not happy with that, you can move to Amazon. Or if Amazon raises it, you can move to Google. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. And I, over several years of development, I've learned that um, being right all the time is pretty much impossible. But being flexible to change is pretty much a necessity, right? Um, how many times have you been you know, coming in and saying, hey, the world's perfect, and you walk in, and boss comes up and says, guess what? I know the world's perfect, but everything's going to change now. <laughs> and the world drops out, right? And you're like, oh, my God, we're going to have to do so much backtracking to get this feature in or this issue in. So again, having open source, having the ability to find bugs, having the ability to contribute to features and to contribute to documentation. If you're not happy with the documentation, you have the power to change it. You have the power to do it. And I think that's a very powerful concept um, in general. So, um, so that's, that's the sales pitch of CouchDB. Um, again, there's uh, some cons, like everything. Um, uh, it is not the fastest database on the planet. You know, it's not going to win any awards there. Um, but, but at the same time, it can work well with other databases that are fast, like a Redis or like a MySQL, and it can play a part in a big solution. Um, and then the, um, you know, the, the, the other uh, con, I guess, is that, um, you know, you, you do, it is very data intensive, so you do need to properly do, um, uh, run compact cycles to keep that database uh, size down and you want to make sure that you're constantly watching the database because that's the one problem that will catch you. If you're not watching your, your disk, it can fill up on you. And in order to do a compaction with Couch, if you have, let's say, a five gigabyte database, in order to compact that, you need 10 gigabytes of room. Um, so, so you need at least 50% of your disk free at all times in order for it to clean itself up. So uh, again, if you're um, you know, using a lot of data, do it in a data center like uh, Google that can give you endless amounts of disk storage um, or uh, you know, have a good team that's really effective at managing that. Um, so uh, the basics of CouchDB, um, it is HTTP and what I want to do is just do a, a short demo. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with Docker? Cool. So Docker is great. I'm going to spin up uh, a CouchDB using uh, Docker. And basically, all you need is one line. And anyone that has Docker installed can easily spin up a CouchDB locally with that one line. So um, I'm going to do this. And Go in here and go here. And I don't have anything in the directory, so I'll just go ahead and, and spin up a CouchDB. And uh, Docker will pull that image down and spin that up for us. And then we'll go through a little bit about how to configure it. But it doesn't take a long time to configure. Um, but once you have a CouchDB running, uh, and, and again, Docker is great for development of CouchDB, but if you're running um, databases in production, uh, you want to use a, a, a service or an infrastructure um, as a service to, to do that, um, not Docker. <laughs> um, so working with databases, to create one, you just do a put, and you put to your database and your database name. To get the database information, you do a get. Is everyone familiar with HTTP verbs? Anyone not familiar with those? Good. Um, and then working with documents, it's the same thing. You just, uh, if you want to create a new document and not give it an ID, let Couch give it to you, you just do a post. Um, if you wanted to get that document, you just do a get with the ID that it gave you. And uh, Couch is uh, very restful, so it's very uh, communicative on what happens. It'll give you an OK true if it was successful, or it would give you an OK false if it failed. Um, to update a document, you just do a put, 
And again, um, since everything's append only, uh, these documents create new versions of the document and it gives you a, a revision ID. And that's how it really manages replication. And that revision ID will also let you identify conflicts. And the conflicts um, allow you to add your own conflict resolution. But the nice thing about this is you have complete control as a developer how your database and your data gets modified. So in this case, when I tried to do a put, I don't include the rev ID and it gives me a conflict um, error. And then if I add the rev ID, then it'll give me an okay true. And then lastly, to delete, the same thing, if I try to just delete the uh, document without giving it a rev, rev ID, then it's going to tell me that you can't do that. And then finally, if I give it the right rev ID, it will give me a, a success. And actually, and, and one key note about that is, is CouchDB doesn't actually delete your document when you call delete. It will actually um, do that during a compaction. It'll, it's just going to set a flag, delete it true, and hide it. So you, and, and you don't want to depend on that, but it's important to know that, that it doesn't delete it until you actually compact. Um, so uh, that's just a, a side note. Let's see how we're doing here. Okay, so we've got our couch DB running, and it's giving a bunch of errors. Let's go see what's going on. Um, So when you come into CouchDB after running the Docker, the first thing you want to do is do a setup. Um, and you can configure Couch, let's see. So you can configure Couch um, as a cluster. So it can run with CouchDB 2.0, it can run as multiple nodes. And you can configure that cluster to shard your data how Ever you want, it'll always keep two copies on the cluster. Um, or you can configure it to be a single node. So we'll do it as a single node. And you just uh, give it a, a username and password, and then hit configure node. And now it will uh, essentially set up a few databases for you. Um, you have a, a user's database, a replicator database, metadata, and global changes. And now if we look at our console, we don't have any errors anymore because now it's, uh, it's a full CouchDB um, running locally, uh, which is kind of cool. So it's not very difficult to set up, uh, just a couple of lines of code, and you can run it. Um, the last thing as far as a, a trick to do is I've got this little, um, how many of you guys have used a tool called curl or postman, right, to send HTTP commands. So I've got a, a little tool like that called uh, relaxing on CouchDB. Um, and it's really, uh, really simple, um, but it's very signaled, right? So, but all it is is a REST client online. Um, you can do a get, or you can do a put, or a post, or a delete. Um, and one of the cool things about it is that it's online, so any database that's online that you can access, uh, you can connect to. But um, our database is local, so how can I um, create a way to access that online? And there's a neat tool called ngrok. How many of you guys have heard of ngrok? Isn't it awesome, right? <laughs> Isn't that the best thing to slice bread? Um, so ngrok will allow you to create an SSL or a SSH or a, a HTTP tunnel, right? So in this case, I'll create an HTTP tunnel um, which will redirect any of my traffic coming from this uh, URL to my local host 5984. And um, this is really great for demos, as you see here. It's uh, really great if you wanted to get someone to look at some of your app or your code, because you could use this for any application, and um, you needed a way to do that without pushing it out to the cloud. So by doing this, it created a, 
um, secure URL here, and I can just uh, copy that URL. And I can come in here and, and paste that into my um, little tool here and hit run. Now, um, this is a uh, front end facing tool. So one of the reasons that it would error out is if we look at the uh, console, we'll see that we need core support. So um, right now, our couch is not set up to handle cores. So we can go into our couch and go into settings, go into cores, and say enable cores. And you can add your specific domains. We'll just do all domains for now for this demo. Um, and, and now we should be able to come in here and do a fetch, and we are connected to our database. Yep. Can I the um, I, I, I could. Um, I'm actually running this query server in the cloud. So, um, right. Let's, well, yeah, let's give it a try. It's more of just a reason to show off in Grok, but let's give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I can't tell if it's working or not. And, uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. But yeah, you're you're right. It, it should it should work unless I'm doing something unless I'm sending the request through the cloud or something. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, okay. Cool, so that, that's the basics. Um, again, uh, you get this really uh, nice console um, that you can use, but pretty much everything, and, and actually this app, this console, um, Foxton or whatever they call it this time, Futon, whatever you wanna call it, um, it's a React app, right? It's written in React and it actually uses the HTTP driver to do everything. So everything you can do in here, you can do programmatically through your code base, uh, which is kind of cool. So um, real quick, we'll go through uh, bulk docs. Um, so with bulk docs, uh, that allows you to get all your documents from your database. You uh, see the all docs command. Um, you can also um, use pagination and, and literally take uh, all docs and you know, to give it a start key, an end key, a limit, tell it how many records to skip, all of that nice stuff um, to, to your entire document database. You can, um, uh, and, and you just do that by just giving it query parameters, right? Query parameters on your URL. Um, so it's pretty straightforward and then to add multiple documents to your database at once, you just do a post and you post to the underscore bulk docs endpoint and you give it a JSON object with a docs node and then that node has an array of all your docs and you can have revisions in them so that can be updates or you could have a deleted equal true and those are deletes. So you have the full ability with one command to totally add documents, change documents, or remove documents um, in uh, one transaction. Um, you can even control the transaction mode um, to be the default mode is optional. So if, um, if one document uh, has a conflict, but the rest are all good, that means all of those will get added and that one will return as an error. Or you can set your transaction mode to all or nothing which means all of them will be added, or if there's an error, they'll all be rolled back. So you get that kind of transactional functionality through bulk docs. Um, talked about replication and talked about uh, conflicts, so you can invoke your own strategy. You can invoke an upsert strategy, 
um, which will basically uh, get the right rev for you and then override it. Um, so it's the last person will always win. Or you can go and do a delta strategy and, and um, don't have time to really get into delta strategies, but it will basically build a consensus and figure out how to do that by a few rules that you give it. And then the, um, the changes feed, the changes feed basically you can go into any uh, database and um, go and view their changes feed. And, and the nice thing about the changes feed is you can say give me from this sequence or you can say give me all the results and continue to give me any new result that comes in um, or anywhere in between. Um, so that's really nice if you want to create uh, reliable, durable services that if they do fail for whatever reason and they go down, when they come back up, they can start from when they last known. They can start from the last known checkpoint so they can replay all of those things. So if like my little email service fails over the weekend and I don't realize it's down until Monday morning, I bring it back up, it can actually replay all the events that happen um, through the weekend and do the right thing. Um, so that's kind of cool. All right. Um, so really what I wanted to talk a little bit more about was um, the finds. Couch 2.0, um, really from Mongo, they created a project called Mango. Right? Um, and Mango is the new Couch TV find, and it uses two endpoints. One endpoint, you just do a, a post to to create an index. And that index, you just uh, provide uh, what uh, nodes that you want to um, query on, and it will build an index for you for those nodes. And then you have an endpoint called underscore find. And underscore find, you give it a set of selectors. And um, just to look at uh, some selectors, I'm just going to pull up. Um, Nolan Lawson's project, and both PouchDB and CouchDB are exactly the same. Um, you can call these through HTTP, but I figured I would show you them in JavaScript because it's a uh, um, pretty cool language. Um, so in this case, I'm using the find endpoint, and I'm passing a selector, and I want to get an ID that is greater than DK. And then I'm going to say, I want to sort by that ID. And then I run the code, and you can see I get any ID that's greater than DK with this data set. If I wanted to say, and my, um, my son's a huge Super Mario fan, so um, I think this is a cool data set. But if I wanted to say, give me all the documents with the ID that's greater than Mario are equal. Um, again, I just uh, run the code. So all of, uh, all of the uh, results are returned as docs, and in JavaScript, you can actually get them back as a promise. So you just do dot min and manage it from there. You wanted to sort by name. So in this case, we're going to create an index, and we're going to use the name field for that index. And then we're going to do a find and say, let's uh, use a selector of name. And we're just giving it a null as greater than, so all the names that actually have a value. And then we're going to sort by name. And uh, that gives us all the. Uh, Mario characters um, sorted by name. Right? And you can also look at, um, you know, greater than and less than here is another one. We're creating an index for the debut field. And then uh, we're passing in the selector with the greater than equal and the year 1990. Um, you can also do ands and ors, and 
If you're uh, familiar with the query language of MongoDB, you can pretty much do everything that MongoDB does. It has a regex, it has in, it has all of those um, uh, nodes or attributes that you can combine to create rich uh, queries, dynamic queries on your data. The, the only thing is, is you have to create the index and provide the fields. And these fields can be, um, uh, they can be, because CouchDB can add multiple, uh, your documents can be complex, right? So you could have a node in your document that points to another object and then in that node or that object have a node that points to another one. You can just use the um, dot syntax um, to drill down into those objects. So you can query not only on the first level, but all the levels in your complex object, which is kind of cool. Okay. And this one's doing two columns, right? So you create an index with series and debut. debut. And then we're selecting on series, and we're sorting on series descending and debut descending. Kind of cool. And then the last thing with the Mango search is you can also select what fields you want to return, and they can be complex fields as well. You just uh, give it a fields node and an array and all the fields that you want to return in your result set. So any questions about the mango find you? Yep. Is the index an actual index? Yep. In CouchDB it is. Yep. So it's in the class reference. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so to to look at it in a, a couch uh, in the CouchDB GUI um, you just go in to you know run a query with mango and when you build this uh, query, um, let's just create. Um, basically, when you build the query, it's actually building a view with uh, a map reduced behind the scenes for that particular query for you. So it's just it's just providing you a little bit better user experience than the um, the map reduce. Uh, process so if you wanted to do a new um, and and with couch db1 you would create a new view and then you would provide it a map function and you would add all of your information in the map function or you could add a reduce as well so um, with the find it allows you to to do that but with a little bit nicer developer experience i like i like the map reduce stuff too um, but the find is, uh, like I said, it's very quick. If you have a bunch of documents and you're using, let's say, a node type to differentiate them, all you have to do is do one index on type and immediately you just say, find all my doc documents by um, widget. Find all my documents where type equals cogs. Find all my documents where uh, type equals places. And you're pulling you know, you've just turned your um, single document store into a store of collections, right? With just, just adding one index. It's pretty cool. So, always get a question about what about joins, right? So, um, you know, uh, Mongo has a, a way to include documents, um, but Couch does not have a way to do joins. Um, but it does give you a powerful query interface and uh, using the find and using um, tools on your application side, um, you can say, give me all the documents that have this ID and their parent ID and you get a collection of documents that come into you as a single array and then you can transform those documents into any kind of object you exist. So that's basically 
the best way to do joints with couches to create these indexes and store your, your data with sort of these relationships inside your database, almost like foreign keys in a relational world, and then query um, your database using the find index or a view and saying, give me all the documents that match this ID and then all the documents that have a parent ID of this ID or a child ID of this ID, and then you get that all in one request. And then you transform that on the, the app side. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the reasons that they don't provide a, a really good case for joins is because when you go into horizontal scaling, um, basically all of that join functionality goes away, right? Um, when you start to horizontally scale um, across uh, distributed data centers and things like that, that ability to join really uh, goes away and you have to find other ways to do that like leveraging um, uh, tools like Elasticsearch or tools like Redis or other um, uh, great fast sort of indexing tools. Um, graph DBs are super great at building relationships and providing the ability to join. Um, and then, you know, going to your, your single source of truth like Couch, you can just say, I've got these five IDs, give me the documents, right, in one request. And, and it will just give you those five IDs using your all docs or your, your bulk uh, get So any questions about joins? <laughs> Answer that okay. Um, and then uh, the last thing is sort of the advanced. Um, I think there's some cool pieces. Compacting, being able to control how you compact your database is very, very cool. And uh, you can keep these databases very small. Um, you just need a lot of uh, room for them to, to perform. Um, and then you have local documents. Local documents are really cool. I can uh, post any document with an ID with underscore local and slash, and that document will never um, show up on the changes feed. It works like really small state management. So if you wanted to store um, some configuration details or store a checkpoint from one of your services that's looking up documents, you can just post that into a local document and it will um, stay there and you can update it as many times and it will um, not generate any extra revisions. It will just always update in place. So that's the one place where I think it's nice to have that kind of thing for you know, configuration details or um, we, we've used it for services that are watching the changes feed so every time they watch the changes feed, they put their last checkpoint in there as a local document. And then that way, if something happens to them when they come back up, they know what last sequence ID was checked so they can continue to replay the changes feed from that point. Um, atomic updates, you can build an atomic update and that's basically to do an update inside the database and it will sort of lock that document as that update's happening so no one can get the document until the update's complete and then everybody gets the newest change. Um, filters, filters are great for sending partial data um, through replication. Uh, filters are also uh, great for filtering changes feeds, right? Um, so you can say I wanna watch the changes but only uh, accounts or only widgets or only um, you know cogs or, or whatever uh, validate documents so again one of the things of having a schemaless database is you can be loose with your structure but it's still very important to make sure you have uh, validity so um, you have a validate document that you can create and it can check and basically make sure whatever document comes in the database that it is valid. So uh, uh, an example of that would be on the users table. There's this design document um, called auth. Let's see. Let me go to it. And 
So basically this uh, design document here, and it doesn't look that great. Uh, basically it has a validate doc update command. There we go. Um, and all it is is a function that takes a new document, an old document, uh, a user, and then you can determine if this document should be created, updated, or deleted um, in that function. And uh, that's really great for adding like uh, JSON schema validation or, or adding any other um, validation or just regular imperative code to validate as well. Um, and then there's a couple of things that I would recommend that you check out. Uh, show functions, list functions, and uh, security. Again, security, just like with anything, is a, a whole talk in itself, but there is some security pieces with Couch. One of the um, things is you basically have admins who can create design documents, and then you have users that can just create regular documents or read regular documents you can create a read-only um, document. Um, and with that, I think my, uh, my time is up, so I'll be happy to take a few questions at this point. You get a free, stress-free ball, so you can be stress-free for the rest of the day. Yeah, you, you could recover it. It's a little bit harder for you to do it, but you could do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think you know it's clustering. Uh, talk about charting your application. Do you drop like, are you reverse proxying as part of your cluster, or is it there? Yeah, so it, it actually has a reverse proxy built in. So you just uh, tell it, and, and you install it on every node, and then you tell those nodes the other nodes, and they connect to each other. Yeah, so the, the way that you create those is you, um, when you're um, in inserting your documents, you can give it a node. A common node is to use type or collection, um, and then you give it a name. And then when you run your queries, you filter on that, and that gives you all the documents of that type or that collection. Convention? It's a convention. Oh. Yeah. So you only have databases. You have databases and you have documents. And then it's up to you as an architect to structure that however it makes sense for your use case. Want a ball? Oh. <laughs> Coming? Oh. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully it was worthwhile.